This is a download from the BBC. To find out more and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk. Hello. We usually start this programme with some urgent questions and provocative clips. This week, however, we decided on a more mellow tone. How about some relaxing music? Here's Alfie Bow and a living prayer. Walk along with no place to call my home. What's that clanking noise? Is it a wannabe drummer banging away in the control room? We'll find out later in feedback. And Five Live and Five Live Sports Extra. Different stations, same match. Balmy, says Maria Kettle. When we retuned, what we found was exactly the same rugby match commentary on the second frequency. And I thought that sort of peak sports listening time on the radio, why are you broadcasting the same thing? What's the point of having two channels if you're going to put out the same thing simultaneously on the two? And thousands of BBC Radio Scotland listeners, including crime authors Val McDermott and Ian Rankin, are protesting at the decision to cancel two of their favourite programmes. I'll ask BBC Scotland's head of radio if news and sport are taking over his world. Actually, news seems to be taking over feedback as well, or rather, complaints about it, and they're directed this week at the inimitable Eddie Mayer and his PM programme, whose apparent obsession with February the 29th is beginning to grate. Wednesday, February the 29th is a day that doesn't happen every year and this year we're inviting PM listeners to take a leap, do something they wouldn't otherwise do. Listeners learnt that Yvonne Goods is going on a geocache treasure hunt. Richard Berkmar will be transcribing some cassette recordings that his nan made before she died and pensioner Carol Hedges is having her first tattoo. Does anybody really care? David Gibbons doesn't. He says the programme has too much inconsequential froth and that on one programme, the February 29th theme was mentioned at the beginning, the middle and the end. Her plans. Liz, you plan to do something you really haven't done for a long time. No, I haven't done it for over 50 years, and that's hula hooping. Jill Kirkham. Please, please, cease the what are you doing on the 29th of February storylines. What a waste of good airtime. Me and my sister Sue used to troll off to Deptford Park Junior Mixed. I can't believe I've just had to listen to five minutes of discussion about hula hooping on Radio 4's PM. This is an absolute low point in broadcasting history. Now for some programmes that seem likely to become history. Many fans of specialist music, especially world and folk, feel the BBC seems not to value the objects of their passion and is putting the squeeze on their favourite programmes. This time last year, the feedback inbox was bulging with emails from folk fanatics who were angry about the axing of the East Midlands music programme Folk Waves. Since then, time has also been called on world music programmes on BBC London and the World Service. And Radio 3's World Roots programme has been bumped from Saturday afternoons to a late-night slot on Sundays. Now listeners in Scotland have been in touch about the decision to axe BBC Radio Scotland's world music programme Global Gathering, along with Janice Forsyth's long-running music and entertainment show. Thousands of disappointed listeners have signed petitions and written letters, and famous fans, including Scottish crime writers Ian Rankin and Val McDermott, have also joined the campaign to reverse the decision. 92 to 95 FM, 810 medium wave, and on digital radio, BBC Radio Scotland. Marvellous music from round the world and round the corner with Mary Ann Kennedy's Global Gathering. We have a special second hour. Hello, my name's Alan Cody, and I, um, I was particularly fond of this programme because it celebrates Scottish and Celtic culture in an international context. From our own communities right at the heart of Glasgow and Edinburgh. Music, dance and the occasional naughty sweet treats from Eastern Europe. And well, this is a sort of programme that you could cite to people as somewhere to uh, come across examples of traditional music that are quite groovy and not fuddy-duddy as many young people might see them. My name is Ian Rankin, the author of the Inspector Rebus novels, uh, and I'm a regular listener to uh, Janice Forsyth. 
That was Aztec Camera. Good morning, Scotland, from Janice Forsyth and indeed beyond these shores. I know plenty of people listen elsewhere in the world. Hello, wherever you are. Very and I was disappointed us. and not far short of horrified when I learned that uh, Radio Scotland were thinking of axing what is a, seen as being a very successful show. I mean, she had a terrific interview with, uh, with Billy Connolly. Um, he doesn't do many radio interviews, um, and it was a bit of a coup for her and for Radio Scotland. Oh, oh it's terrible. Uh, they can't do anything. Uh-huh. And you can't move. But you had to get back on the trike. I had to get back on, but getting out of bed is nightmarish. Well, my name's Martin, Martin Davis. I live up in, in northwest Scotland. And there is already, on a Saturday morning, an awful lot of talking, news and sports. And so I'm not sure that the case necessarily for that more talk and more news and more sports and such like and less music is necessarily well made. My name is Val McDermott. I'm a crime writer. I suppose you could argue that someone like me has a self-interest in keeping shows like this on the air. Um, but on the other hand, it seems to me daft at a time when Scotland is asking itself questions about who it is and its place in the world that you'd want to cut the Janice Forsyth show. Jeff Szynski is the head of radio for BBC Scotland. I asked him why the programmes are going. I can take Global Gathering first of all. Uh, Global Gathering, for those not familiar with the programme, is a a programme which combines uh, Scottish folk music with looking at its connections with world music around the world. Now, we also have a programme called Travelling Folk. We believe that by tweaking the remit of Travelling Folk, we can accommodate, perhaps not entirely, but some of the remit of uh, Global Gathering. But my understanding is that you're replacing Global Gathering with a programme which will be exclusive exclusively about classical music. Yes, but can I just say, uh, and, I'm, and I'm not shroud-waving here, but what this allows us to do is to spread the resources across the remaining programmes. We wouldn't have had the resources to provide live sessions, coverage of events, interviews. It, they would have been simply disc-based programmes for all our music programmes. Are you saying so, that the range, therefore, is going to be maintained, even if, as it were, the volume of programmes in that area will not be? Yes, the range of programmes will be maintained, but I, you know, I accept there is an issue in terms of our coverage of, of world music. Um, you know, we will pick that up, obviously, in festivals like Celtic Connections. We will uh, pick it up in travelling folk. But bear in mind, you know, Mary Ann Kennedy, who presents Global Gathering, also presents a world music programme on Radio 3. So in terms of the BBC's total provision in radio of world music, that will be maintained. And does she have a future on BBC Scotland? She certainly does. I know you've been hearing uh, various criticisms of our scheduled changes, and that's understandable. And I certainly have had about 40 emails and a number of letters and indeed a strange encounter with a man on a train yesterday, all who were uh, very anxious about the future of Mary Ann. But what's happening with Mary Anne is not only will she continue on BBC Radio Scotland uh, in terms of two new programmes, we hope, she continues on our sister national station in Scotland, Radio Nangail. She continues to broadcast on BBC Alba and on BBC Radio 3 as well. Well, let's now turn to the programme presented uh, by Janice Forsyth on mm-hmm. Saturday because people who've written to us say actually it was a completely different sort of programme, a unique programme, which isn't being replicated elsewhere. Well, I can, as I say, I can completely understand it. If we have spent uh, you know, almost 18 years promoting Janice Forsyth in the Saturday morning schedule. She has many fans, many friends, many people will feel the loss of that programme. But it was absolutely a music-based programme. Now, our strategy here, which is basically to uh, position BBC Radio Scotland as a speech station in daytime and specialist music in the evening makes sense in a number of ways, not least the fact that uh, speech radio is where well, where where we spend more money and where the biggest uh, audience for Radio Scotland are coming. But if you look at the schedule that's going to um, that it operates now on Saturday, it is going to be a pretty unremittingly news and sport, isn't it, from top to bottom, or mm. certainly from eight o'clock in the morning through. Now that you take away the one program, the Janice Forsyth show, that perhaps was a little different. Uh, well, absolutely, and I'm not denying it's going to be a, 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 a schedule which is very much a speech-based schedule. There's going to be an expanded edition of uh, Good Morning Scotland on a Saturday. Eventually, there's going to be a new current affairs discussion programme, and then that will lead into the sports programme, which incidentally is not a football programme, but deals with other sports such as rugby, tennis, golf, uh, and the rest, it's, and athletics. It's not uh, a football programme, as some have claimed. But what this, uh, what people do feel 
obviously about the BBC and BBC in Scotland and elsewhere, is you have a unique position in terms of providing what the commercial sector does not, Mm -hmm. ensuring that your local community, the the, the arts, music, whatever is represented, and also doing music in terms of world music that wouldn't easily fit into a lot of commercial stations. People see this as a narrowing of the agenda. Well, I think we're one of the only stations that has an absolute remit in our service licence to provide a daily arts programme. So, I mean, I don't think the charge of us not covering Scottish culture is valid. Look, we have made schedule changes in the past. Some have worked and some have not worked. But you take about a year to see how these things bed in. Even a year's time, if we get to May next year, and I believe you know we've absolutely screwed this up, then of course we would uh, we would review it again. But remember, these decisions are not based on you know, me sitting in a, in a penthouse suite stroking a, a white cat. They're based on a very careful analysis of what the audience wanted from us. Jeff Sosinski, head of radio for BBC Scotland. Now... A little less conversation. A little more action, please. Come in, Mr Presley. It's that clanking noise again. The sound of Elvis turning in his grave. My merry band of Twitter followers have been playing a guessing game about what's causing it. Ian Michelle. Very spooky clicking. The sort of noise you might get at a seance. Perhaps it's Nigel Pardew searching for Radio Borsetshire. Not even close. Keep trying. Now, what's the point of a speech network if you can't hear what people are saying because everyone is talking over each other? The new series of Moral Maze is prompting some full and frank emails. Last week I spoke to the programme's long-running chairman, Michael Burke, about what it takes to keep a live debate under control. But he's not the only programme host whose credentials have been under the feedback listener's microscope. John Ling takes aim first at any questions. I just thought that this week's broadcast was very poor because it was so loud and so irritating with everybody shouting at each other all the time. It was not a well-run debate. Um, If I was in the pub with this lot, it would be a different matter. Letting people shout each other down is not good chairmanship and it's not good radio. And I just wondered if your guests were given any guidelines before the broadcast. And when four people, including the chairman, are all speaking at once, it just sounds bad. <laughs> but the problem, the problem, the problem is to pay for unemployment and welfare benefits when what we should be doing... My name is Jane Talbot, and I'm calling from Isleworth in West London. Producers and presenters seem to have forgotten that when two or more people speak at the same time, listeners at home cannot hear what any of the speakers are saying. That's a very poor argument. And what Sally, we actually, have to do your, is your, to... Know, your no, report uh, actually uh, specifically uh, showed that, that science, technology, engineering and mathematics hadn't really been affected very much. So what your, your figures shows, actually don't, don't show that Goodness me, I think, I think some manners here and let me finish. Go on, finish, but make it brief, please. <laughs> very brief. The worst culprits being the Today programme, any questions, the moral maze and the Westminster Hour. Please, please, can producers and presenters be persuaded to remind their guests beforehand and to intervene quickly if two or more people start speaking at once. Patient safety and the quality of care. It's fact. It's what it is, it's, it's about... Fact. No, it's not fact. What it is, it's Carolyn about... Quinn made a brave attempt in the Westminster Hour last weekend by saying something like, if you both speak at once, the listeners don't the like it. Of who can provide the very best treatment? But That's why does the Patients Association then think oh, that this will make the situation much, much worse? And there's no point us all talking at once because no. the listeners hate it. And, you know, so let's calm down. Um, uh, We're always calm. Former Archbishop of Canterbury, George Carey, was determined to get his message across this week, as Philip Burroughs couldn't help but notice when he listened to interviews with him on the Aled Jones show on Radio 2 and on the Today programme. He kept referring to his latest book. Normally I let these things wash over me, but the amount of times he kept saying, in my book, was irritating, almost amusing. Can these guests be asked beforehand to tone down the number of times they plug their books? It wasn't that repetitive, was it, Philip? Uh, The book that my son Andrew and I have written called We Don't Do God speaks exactly into this kind of situation. Our book is actually saying that what is going on is a slow... I I say in the book that um, I 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, uh, going back to my book, uh, I hope it will encourage people to say, yes, the Christian faith is still relevant. Mm. Thirteen times in about 20 minutes. The publishers must be pleased. But are you? More generally, feedback listeners regularly flag concerns about the plugging of new books. So do keep letting me know what you think. Now back to those otherworldly noises infecting local radio programmes. been tweeting BBC R4 Feedback with a few more suggestions for our mystery noise competition. The BBC Local Radio Forum reckons it's BBC management, making tiny but discernible cuts to BBC output. Steve Doherty says that glitch has been affecting all local radio online for weeks. Stay tuned, we will find the reason for it. And if you have any other mysteries you'd like me to solve, or issues to raise about anything you've heard on BBC Radio Lately, good or bad then please let me know. You can write to Feedback, P.O. Box 67234, London SE 1P 4AX, or leave a phone message on 03 Standard landline charges apply, but it could cost more on some mobile networks. Or you can email feedback at bbc.co.uk. All those details are on our website. Now, two for the price of one might be considered a good deal. But one for the price of two? Where's the benefit in that? A number of Five Live listeners have been in touch to ask why Five Live and Five Live Sports Extra are broadcasting the same games at the same time. Michael Carr is the sports editor for both networks and he's agreed to explain the duplication. But first we hear from feedback listener Maria Kettle of Cambridge who thought she was hearing things when she switched between the two stations to hear the same rugby match on both networks. The same happened to John Taylor who was listening to a recent Sheffield Wednesday versus Blackpool game and naturally expected a good 90 minutes worth. Around about 20 minutes to go in the Sheffield-Blackpool game Radio 5 Live all of a sudden went to the commentary of the Southampton-Millwall game, which now meant that Southampton and Millwall were on both channels, and we lost the end of the Sheffield-Blackpool game. It certainly wasn't a one-off. They have done this before, and that's what I couldn't understand. Why interrupt a match on one channel to put the same match eventually on both channels and um, ending the enjoyment of the match that we were listening to. My name's Maria Kettle and I live in Cambridge. I tune into Radio 5 Live on a Saturday night because my husband likes listening to the football match roundups, and I quite enjoy it too. But this last Saturday, uh, it was replaced by the rugby. and We thought, OK, it's not our thing, but we'll retune to 5 Live Extra so we can pick it up there, hopefully. And when we retuned, what we found was exactly the same rugby match commentary on the second frequency. And I thought that sort of peak sports listening time on the radio, why are you broadcasting the same thing? What's the point of having two channels if you're going to put out the same thing simultaneously on the two? Michael Carr is Five Live Sports editor. I asked him, what's the point of having an extra radio station if it's not giving you something extra, just more of the same? Michael Carr, can we start with uh, Maria Kettle's observation that you had the identical, and in her case, unwanted rugby commentary on both networks. Why did it happen? Um, well, these are quite rare and isolated cases. Um, in this particular case, um, we started the rugby union commentary on Sports Extra um, because we had a big uh, 3 o'clock Premier League show um, involving all the football from 3 o'clock and the England-Italy Italy England game was kicking off at um, 4 p.m., so we put the first half on Sports Extra. Uh, clearly it's a big sporting event and we wanted to get that on to Five Live in the second half once the football had finished, which did mean taking Sports Report off air. Now the reason that happened was we missed the first five minutes um, on Five Live of the second half because we wanted to get the classified football results with James Alexander-Gordon out. That's obviously a key part of, of what we give to the audience at around five o'clock. 
So we kept that um, we kept it running on Sports Extra because otherwise we'd have missed three or four minutes of commentary. Now there's no point then taking it off Sports Extra. There was nothing else to replace it with. It would have been just dead air. You're saying effectively you had nothing to put on a Saturday. You had nothing else to put on Five Live Sports Extra. Um, Five Live Sports Extra is there to run live sporting events that are not able to schedule in full on Five Live. Due to the service licence remit, we can't put uh, magazine shows or reporting shows such as Sports Report onto Five Live Sports Extra. It is purely for live sporting events. Well, you say this is a rare and isolated instance, but we've Mm. heard John Taylor describe that roughly the same thing happened with the Sheffield Wednesday Blackpool uh, fourth round FA Cup replay, except that you lost the end of the Sheffield Wednesday Blackpool match. So you had two channels covering one match and you deserted a second match. Now, how did that happen? Well, I'll explain the circumstances behind that one as well. If I can just point out that um, on Sports Extra, we've done over 150 commentaries since November the 1st, so that's in a sort of three-month three period. This situation has only happened three times. Um, so you're isolating two of the cases here, which is fine, and I can certainly explain the um, the thinking behind the, uh, the FA Cup uh, games that you're talking about. Mm. Um, we bill our FA Cup shows uh, on Five Live Sport as an evening of FA Cup and we go to where the story is. That's the key selling point of our FA Cup commentaries. The FA Cup contract um, allows us to do that, which the Premier League doesn't. Um, And also the beauty of radio and the flexibility means that we can go to where the story is, where TV wouldn't be able to do because of all the um, outside broadcasting, engineering, etc. But can you understand the frustration where somebody, let's say they're a passionate Blackpool or Sheffield Wednesday fan, and they suddenly lose the coverage, the commentary on their match, so it goes to another one, an interesting one perhaps. So they therefore switch perhaps to Five Live Sports Extra to find out if you're continuing the Sheffield Wednesday Blackpool match, and you aren't, in fact... On both those networks, you're getting the same match and the one, presumably, a Blackpool or Sheffield Wednesday supporter does not want to listen to. I can understand particularly that, that, that this particular listener was upset. If, if you look at it from a, from a broad audience perspective and what the listener got that evening, they got the Sheffield Wednesday Blackpool game, which went to 3-0 with 20 minutes left. We then picked up the Southampton Millwall game on 5 Live, which was one all, and then finished 3-2 in a very dramatic finish. Now, we wanted to be able to retain the uh, ability to give updates on the Sheffield Wednesday Blackpool game on Five Live as well, which is why we didn't switch it to Sports Extra. And that game was 3-0, it finished 3-0. So I think editorially um, the decision was correct in terms of an exciting evening of FA Cup football, which is what we said at the start. But a listener who wants to listen to the Sheffield Wednesday Blackpool match throughout wasn't able to do so. A listener who wanted to listen to the Southampton Millwall match or the end of it would have had two opportunities. It seems a rather strange way of going about these things. Is this So that was intentional. That's not accidental. That's not a function of something going wrong elsewhere. This was a deliberate editorial decision. It was a deliberate editorial decision based on the fact that we in FA Cup commentaries on our FA Cup programmes we have this ability to switch our commentaries to go to where the story is developing and we will do it when we think it's editorially justified. Uh, it sounds as if uh, in the future the same thing may happen again. It's quite a rare occurrence. It's a very rare occurrence, and each situation is um, is quite a unique set of circumstances that's offered. But I'll you're not really get out happening again. You're saying that it's quite possible in the future that you will take that editorial decision. Yes, I will, but it, it is very rare, and I'll give you those statistics again. 150 commentaries over since November. It's happened three times. Um, totaling probably around 60-odd minutes of radio. So it is rare, um, but we will do it again if we think it's editorially justified. Our thanks to Michael Carr. Two stalwarts of Radio 4 Comedy are back on the air. Count Arthur Strong, who is loved and hated in equal measure, and The Now Show, in which listener Nick Spencer said that John Finnemore pulled off a miracle of comedy last week. Three minutes of optional prayers are an infringement of human rights now, In that case, my school was like a Soviet gulag. My name is Nick Spencer. I am research director at Theos, the religion and society think tank. The sketch last week about Biddeford Council prayers managed to be both funny and fair. It would have been very easy and lazy to have mocked Biddeford Council for living in the Middle Ages or something like that. It would have been more unusual, but still unbalanced, to have ridiculed Councillor Clive Bone and Richard Dawkins for being selfish or being belligerent, but it took real courage to point out and to satirise the faults 
and the floors of both sides. So for that reason and no other, the prayers had to stop after all, which was a shame, but luckily everyone kept it in proportion. The Christian councillors said their prayers before the meeting officially began and everyone lived happily ever... Uh, no, I've done it again. Uh... All too often, comedy and religion either don't mix or they mix badly. What John Finnemore did was to show that it can and it should be done. Evangelical church, the Bethel Free Church, the Society of Friends meeting house, and that is it. <laughs> I think what I'm saying is it's a pity they have to scrap the prayers, but I also think Christianity can weather this storm. <laughs> Funny and fair. That's an unusual combination. Now, I know you're dying to hear the answer to the mystery noise competition. Not long now. But just before we reveal the results, this. Lots of listeners have written in in response to my interview a couple of weeks back about problems with the BBC iPlayer. Many of you have found that whilst TV programmes are edited very neatly at the beginning and at the end, radio appears to be the poor relation, with chunks of trails and bits and bobs of news littering both ends of the programme. Or even worse, the end of the programme lopped off altogether. Andrew Scott, the BBC's Head of Radio and Music for Future Media, explained that with frequent changes to transmission times because of the varying nature of live radio, as well as the sheer volume of radio programmes to put onto iPlayer, occasional problems were, well, inevitable. But spare a thought for listeners of local radio. When they listen on iPlayer, it sounds like this. My name is Suleiman, and all the channels that I've been listening to have been distorted by clicks and pops. I'm a jazz musician and enjoy listening to the jazz on the BBC. A um, particular programme I was listening to was Hereford and Worcester's uh, Jazz with John Hellings. This one, from onward, is a living prayer. And as I was about to uh, send him an email to say that there was a problem, he mentioned the problem and said other people had been mentioning it as well, and that uh, they were going to try and fix the problem. But we're some weeks later now, and the problem still isn't fixed, and I've just checked it. And it's both live and recorded material on the iPlayer. The national radio stations are fine, but all the local radio stations are as good as unlistenable. Time to reveal the cause of the mystery sound. Here is a BBC statement. We apologise to listeners of BBC Local Radio. The problem lies with a piece of technical equipment which is failing. We have ordered a replacement, but it's a specialised piece of kit which needs to be individually manufactured. We hope to have it fixed by early March. That piece of dodgy technical equipment is in fact a failing motherboard. Not a failing Ouija board, then, or the ghost of Nigel Pargeter desperately trying to get in touch. So, no winner for this week's competition. I'll just have to hang on to that much-coveted and personally autographed photo of yours truly. It'll have to go back to my bedside, where I could see it first thing in the morning and last thing at night, to ward off existential angst and crises of identity. Goodbye. <laughs>